Wish, Chapter 6 A few days later, Miss Willoughby called Bertha about my bad attitude. That day in school, she had asked me if I had two-thirds of a piece of pie, and I wanted to give half to my sister, then how much of the whole pie would that be? I told her I wouldn't give my sister any of my pie. Everybody had laughed except Mrs. Willoughby. She had turned red and pressed her lips together and made her eyes into little slits when she looked at me. When she called Bertha that afternoon, I was stretched out in Gus's easy chair watching TV. The fat orange cat named Flora was curled up in my lap. I heard Bertha say, She did? And, Oh dear. Then she lowered her voice and I could only make out bits and pieces drifting through the kitchen door. A rough time. Missing her family been hard on her. Then she hung up and I kept my eyes on the TV when she came in and sat on the couch. That was Mrs. Willoughby, he said. A fast-talking guy on TV was pouring chocolate syrup on the floor and mopping it up with a miracle mop. She told me, you've, had a, you've been a little rude in school, Bertha said. Now the man on TV was showing the set of knives that came free with the miracle mop. Then Bertha started going on about how she knows how upset I must be about my family being all broken like it is. Well, she didn't use the word broken, but she might as well have. She said she knew how it must be scary to see Mama like she was. How I must be worried sick about Scrappy. How I must miss Jackie so much. I kept my eyes on the mopping man, and in my head I said, Pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. But Howard's stupid idea didn't work because the next thing I knew, I was hollering at Bertha. Mean words about minding her own business and who cared about my broken up sorry excuse for a family. Not me, that was for sure. The words kept spewing and got louder and faster. How I hated Colby and all those hillbilly kids in this nasty old house hanging off the side of the mountain and those canning jars in my room and especially those Cinderella pillowcases. Then I stalked outside, letting the screen door slam behind me and trying not to think about Bertha sitting there on the couch looking like she'd been stabbed in the heart. A couple of cats leaped out of my way as I stormed across the yard and up the driveway toward the road. I kicked at the dirt and yanked on leaves and hurled gravel into the woods. When I got to the road, I didn't even care that the asphalt was burning hot under my feet. The... the the mad was swirling inside me, making my ears ring and my stomach churn. But then, the next thing I knew, I was sitting in the dirt on the side of the road crying so hard I couldn't hardly breathe. What was wrong with me? Why had I said those mean things to Bertha? Why was I acting so hateful at school? And then, while I was sitting there wallowing in my pity, somebody said, What's the matter, Charlie? I looked up to see Howard standing by his bicycle in front of me. I put my head on my knees and mumbled, nothing. Must be something, he said. Go away. Nah, he said, laid his bas bicycle in the weeds by the road and sat next to me. You have to tell me what's the matter. This boy be all. He sure had a lot of gumption for a little old redhead up and up down boy. I don't have to tell you anything, I said. Then you have to tell somebody. He pushed at his glasses. Why? My mama says you should never keep your troubles to yourself, because if you share them with somebody, they get smaller. Go away, I said. Did you kick somebody again? I shook my head. Poke them with a pencil? No, I hollered. Mama made this needlepoint sign that says if all our troubles were hung on a line, you'd choose yours and I'd choose mine. I lifted my head and stared at him. What's that supposed to mean? I asked him. It means everybody's got troubles, and some of them, some of them are worse than yours. He yanked at a blade of grass and tossed it into the road. Or something like that, he added. Ha! Huh, that was a good one. I couldn't think of anybody with worse troubles than me. Then I looked at Howard with his eyebrows knitted together and a look of pure worry on his face. Before I knew it, I was spilling those troubles out to him. I told him how I wished Scrappy wasn't in jail, how he and I used to play poker and watch Wheel of Fortune and eat macaroni and cheese for breakfast. 
I told him how scared I was when I saw my mama crying into her pillow in her dark bedroom, not even caring one little bit whether I had clean clothes or even went to school. I told him how Mama and Scrappy would holler at each other the live long day while me and Jackie sat on her bed with the radio turning up loud so we didn't have to hear him. I told him about all those times I watched the bedroom window when Scrappy drove off with his tires screeching and gravel flying while Mama yelled, Good riddance to bad rubbish from the front porch. I told him how much I missed Jackie who knew all the words to nearly every song on the radio and would French braid my hair and share her nail polish with me. And then I told him those mean things I'd said to Bertha. When I was done, the silence settled over us, still and soft like a veal. The sun had gotten lower in the sky, sitting on top of the mountains in the distance, and the air had grown cooler. For a minute, I thought maybe Howard was embarrassed by all the stuff I'd told him, and he didn't know what to say. I was starting to wish I had never shared my troubles with him like that, but when he looked right at me and said, Want my advice? Um, sure, I guess, I said. You can't do nothing about Scrappy and them back in Rayleigh, he said. The only thing you can fix is what you done to Bertha. I guess he was right. I couldn't fix my mess of a family, but I could try to make things right with Bertha. I, stu I stood up and brushed the dirt off the back of my shorts. And then I couldn't hardly believe my eyes. Right there at the edge of the woods was that brown and black floppy-eared dog. I put my finger to my lips and went, Shh! The dog was watching me with his head cocked to the side. Don't move, I whispered to Howard. I took one slow step toward the dog. And guess what? He wagged his tail. Two tiny little wags. That dog liked me. Hey, fella. I said, taking another step, and wouldn't you know it, a car came roaring up the road and whizzed past us, and that dog darted off into the woods. I stomped my foot. Dang it! I'd almost forgotten Howard was there when he said, I've seen that dog before. He's mine, I said. Really? Well, he's gonna be. I bet he's full of ticks, he said, and he might have the mange. Gray dogs have the mange. So what, I said. His name is Wishbone. The minute I said that, it felt right. Wishbone. That was the perfect name for my dog. I'm going to catch him, I said. Then I'll bathe him and get the ticks off him and teach him tricks and let him sleep in the bed with me. I'll help you catch him, Howard said, picking his bike out of the weeds. You will? Sure. Suddenly, Howard seemed different. He didn't seem so much like a nosy up-down boy, nagging me half to death about being my backpack buddy. He seemed more like somebody being nice to me, somebody I had shared my troubles with. I watched them get on his bike and pedal off toward his house. Then I called, bye Wishbone, into the woods before I hurried up the road to make things right with Bert.